Hello, my name is Dr. Roderick L. Roll, and today I will be talking to you about the central dogma theory. The central dogma theory is a process that takes DNA that's inside of a cell and produces a protein from it. So DNA is double-stranded and it resides in the nucleus of a eukaryotic cell and also in the mitochondria and the chloroplast. Through a process called transcription, mRNA will be produced. This mRNA will then be processed to make mature mRNA. The mature mRNA will then travel out of the nucleus through the nuclear pore into the cytoplasm. The mature mRNA will then bind to the ribosome. That is where the second part of the central dogma theory will occur. It is called translation. Translation is going to create a polypeptide chain. So the central dogma theory is composed of transcription and translation. For this talk, we will just cover transcription. Transcription is composed of three parts, initiation, elongation, and termination. We will first talk about initiation. A transcription factor will be needed to start this process. What will the transcription factor do? It will first loosen the histones. Remember that DNA wraps around nucleosomes and the nucleosome is composed of eight histones. So this is a very tightly coiled molecule that needs to be loosened. So first the DNA will go from heterochromatin configuration to euchromatin configuration. Euchromatin is less packed. Then the transcription factor will even loosen the euchromatin even more. The second thing the transcription factor will do is it will find and bind to the promoter region. The promoter region is a sequence of DNA that specifies the start site for RNA synthesis. That promoter sequence is a non is on the non template strand so DNA is double stranded one strand is referred to as the template strand and the other strand is referred to as the non template in the image below we are looking at a non template strand on that segment of DNA we will have two consensus sequences one of them is upstream from the start site 35 nucleotides away. The other one is upstream 10 nucleotides away. So the consistent sequences are pretty standard for all genes. So the most common one that we will use is the Tata box. So if I give you a sequence on the test, start at the 5 prime end wherever it is on the left side of the paper or on the right side of the paper find the 5 prime end and then travel towards the 3 prime end and look for these two consensus sequences so just look for the tata box in the orientation of T A T A A T where will transcription actually start it will actually start where it says plus one. So plus one 
is usually the adenine that is on the non-template strand. This is different nucleotide sequences that have been um, sequenced from Escherichia coli. These are all promoter sequences. You can see the two consensus sequences. Note that the yellow box, the yellow highlighted sequences are the Tata boxes. They're typically about 10 nucleotides upstream from the initiation site, which is typically an A. The template strand is where the mRNA transcript comes from. So again, DNA is double-stranded. We have a non-template strand and a template strand. So the template strand in this picture is the bottom strand. Note that it reads from 3 to 5 on the bottom strand versus the top strand reads from 5 to 3. Remember the two consensus sequences are on the non-template strand. The third thing transcription factor will do is it will mediate the binding of RNA polymerase 2. So first the transcription factor will bind to the promoter then it will alert RNA polymerase 2 to where it needs to go and bind. Once it has bound to the transcription factor we will create a complex that is called the transcription initiation complex. So the completed assembly of the transcription factors and based on our image we can have three, four, we can have numerous transcription factors. This is going to bind to the promoter sequence, those two consensus sequences. Then the transcription factor will alert RNA polymerase 2 to combine. Now the TIC complex is complete. In bacteria, they do not have TF or transcription factor. They will have SF, a sigma factor. So the sigma factor is synonymous with the transcription factor. In eukaryotes, like humans, three types of RNA polymerases exist. Polymerase 1, 2, and 3. Also, eukaryotes have numerous different types of transcription factors. RNA transcription occurs in the nucleus, but it can also occur in the mitochondria and the chloroplast because those two organelles contain DNA also. Remember, they were theorized to once have been a bacteria that infected a eukaryotic cell. It is referred to as the endosymbiotic theory. This slide shows that we have different types of RNA polymerases. DNA polymerase 1 makes rRNA, DNA polymerase 2 makes mRNA, also it makes snRNA and snORNA. And DNA, I mean RNA polymerase 3 makes tRNA. So what's important for us today is that we know that RNA polymerase 2 is the main one that we're going to use today for transcription. So we have initiated transcription. Now we're going to elongate and make the, the, the message. RNA polymerase reads from 3 to 5 prime direction on the template strand and it is going to synthesize a new mRNA from 5 to 3. Note in the image that you're not going to convert the blue DNA strand into a red DNA strand. You're going to make a red RNA strand from the blue DNA strand. So we don't convert DNA into RNA. 
we make RNA from DNA. This image shows the directionality. Again, the promoter sequences are located on the 5' prime end of this non-template strand. And the template strand, you're going to read from 3 to 5. So my TIC complex is moving from left to right in this image. And what is coming out of the butt of the TIC is this red messenger RNA. The end that comes out of the butt first is the 5' prime end. How does this occur? The TIC complex is going to open up the two strands. The two strands are held together by hydrogen bonds. So only about 20 nucleotides are opened up at a time. A single gene can have many RNA polymerases bound at one time. So two individuals, a black guy and a white guy, have the same number of melanin genes in a cell. But the black guy makes more of the protein. The protein is called melanin. How? Well, they both have the same number of genes. Let's say the white guy has one melanin gene and the black guy has one melanin gene. The black guy might have many RNA polymerases that are reading that gene from three to five prime direction. Therefore, it's going to make more of the protein product. The white guy might only have one RNA polymerase reading from three to five. So he'll make less of the protein. In this slide, we're looking at template versus non-template strands. Remember, the promoter is on the non-template strand. But the non-template strand is more important than just recognition by the transcription factor and RNA polymerases. It also can be used to figure out what your code is. So the non-template strand is also called the coding strand. Because if you had the non-template strand, all you would have to do is change the T's to use, and that would be your mRNA. In this slide, we have a replicated chromosome. So this chromosome has two chromatids that are held together by a centromere. Each chromatid has nucleosomes and the DNA is wrapped around them. This has to be loosened and then your transcription factors will bind. They will then recruit the RNA polymerases and then you will make your message. So RNA polymerase exposes roughly 10 to 20 DNA nucleotides at a time. So this TIC complex is not going to just unravel the entire chromosome. It's only going to open up, it's only going to break hydrogen bonds and expose the, the actual template and non-template of about 20 nucleotides at a time. Average RNA polymerase II movement in mammalian cells range between 1.3 and 4.3 kilobases per minute. Now we have elongated the message. Now we're going to stop. We're going to terminate the message. We are going to discuss two methods of terminating the sequence. The first one was first seen in bacteria. It is called self-termination. Typically 50 nucleotides are produced per second. 
This is standard in non-GC rich areas. Remember, wherever a G is bound to a C, there's three hydrogen bonds that hold those two nucleotides together. Whereas between the A and the T, there's only two hydrogen bonds that hold those two together. So just in a regular standard sequence of DNA, the RNA polymerase, the TIC complex, is going to move at a rate of 50 nucleotides per second. Whenever the TIC complex encounters a GC rich area, remember three, nu three hydrogen bonds hold G to the C. So if I have 20 G's and 20 C's, when the TIC complex arrives at that location, it's going to slow down from 50 nucleotides per second to maybe 10 nucleotides per second. So the formation of a mRNA GC stem loop will occur because of this slowed speed. So imagine this red squiggly line is your mRNA. If you have 10 guanines right next door to 10 cytosines, what can happen is that portion can fold back on itself because wherever a G is, it wants to bind to a C. So if you have 10 G's and 10 C's side by side, the interaction of those two nucleotides can occur. So I made a star to show you that that area on the right of the star, those are all of the G's. On the left of the star is all the C's. Whenever you have a G next to a C, you are going to create hydrogen bonds. So this is going to create what is called a GC stem loop. That is created because of the slowing down of the RNA polymerase. This loop that was created is going to create tension. Look at the red star. That is a GC stem loop in the mouth of the TIC complex. The TIC complex is trying to move and read 50 nucleotides per second. But this GC stem loop has created enough tension to make that fall off. Therefore, you would terminate transcription because of that tension. The second method to terminate transcription is called road dependent termination protein. This protein is highlighted by the red star. It is going to bind to the 5' prime end of that same squiggly line which is the messenger RNA and it's going to travel from the 5' prime end going back towards the 3' prime end. When it gets close enough to the mouth of the TIC complex it's going to also create tension which is going to ultimately make the TIC complex fall off. This is also going to terminate transcription. Now we are going to process RNA. Three mRNA processing events will occur. The first one occurs after the first 40 nucleotides have been added. A modified guanine cap will be added to the 5 prime end. This is like a shield that will protect the 5 prime end from degradation. Inside of the cell you have these dicer proteins, these, these enzymes that will cut up single-stranded mRNA. But if you protect the 5 prime end, you inhibit this degradation. 
The second thing that occurs is RNA polymerase is going to transcribe a polyadenylation sequence. That is U, I mean AAUAAA. This is going to be located at the three prime end of the mRNA message. Another enzyme is going to then come and add about 250 adenines to the polyadenylation sequence. Why is this added? It is there to protect the message. So those same scissors natural scissors that are inside of your cell that are looking for single-stranded mRNA are going to start chopping up the mRNA from the three prime end but you have 300 adenines there to protect it so let's say that every 10 adenines that are cut off takes one hour if it's 300 adenines that are at the end of your sequence your mRNA sequence then that is going to take several hours before you actually start to degrade your actual message so therefore the poly A tail and the 5 prime cap are there to help protect the message that's number two Number one, they also help facilitate the export of mRNA out of the nucleus. And thirdly, they're going to help mRNA attach to the ribosome. The third thing that occurs to the message in reference to processing is we're going to splice the transcript we're going to cut out unwanted segments most eukaryotic genes and their transcripts that they're going to make will have long non-coding stretches of nucleotides that are going to lie between coding regions These non-coding regions are called intervening sequences or introns. These introns used to be called junk DNA. Back in the early 2000s, scientists didn't know what they were used for. So we just theorized that they were cut out and never used. But recent studies suggest that some introns can regulate gene expression whereas many of them can control the gene product. The introns are highlighted by these big red arrows. The exons are highlighted by these big red arrows. Notice that the pink portion is going to be cut out. They're called introns and the exons are going to stay. The exons are in red. So the other region is called the exon. RNA splicing is going to remove the introns and join exons together, therefore creating a seamless, continuous coding sequence. If you look at this picture, notice that the exon is between nucleotide 1 and 30 then the introns might be another 50 nucleotides but they're not going to be counted because they're going to be cut out and then your next exon is from 31 to 104 so eventually all the introns will be cut out and the exons will be spliced together to make a seamless continuous code RNA splicing is carried out by spliceosomes. So a spliceosome consists of a variety of proteins and several small nuclear ribonucleoproteins. 
the small nuclear ribonuclear protein is called SNRPs. So I like to refer to it as SNRP SNRPs because there's several SNRP SNRPs involved in creating the spliceosome. So if we look in the picture below, we have that circle that is called the spliceosome. It is composed of four SNRP SNRPs and a big complex of many proteins. Collectively, they're going to cut out the introns. So the spliceosome is composed of the SNRP SNRPs and the protein. The SNRP SNRPs are composed of proteins and SNRNA. So the actual scissor, the actual thing that is doing the cutting is RNA in nature. The thing that does the cutting is RNA in nature. These RNAs act as catalytic molecules. It is called SNRNA. It makes up the SNRP SNRP. So SNRNA was one of the first non-protein molecules discovered that catalyzes a reaction besides ribozymes. Remember, most of the enzymes that we've heard of are protein based. We even looked at an enzyme in lab. We put the enzyme in ice and it hindered the product formation. Then when we put it in boiling water, it destroyed the product formation. That was an example of a protein based enzyme. When we talked about glycolysis, there was 10 enzymes involved in making glucose or converting glucose into pyruvate. All of those were protein based enzymes. These enzymes have catalytic properties. The SNRNA that makes up the SNRP SNRPs is it has catalytic activity but it is not protein based it is RNA based ribozymes also have catalytic properties a ribozyme is also a RNA molecule that functions just like an enzyme so the discovery of ribozymes and SNRNA rendered obsolete the theory and belief that all biological catalysts were protein based. Some genes can encode for more than one kind of polypeptide depending on which segment is treated as exon during splicing. This is referred to as alternative RNA splicing. If we look at the picture below, we have the DNA double-stranded sequence. The gene in question is troponin T. We're going to bring in our TIC complex and create the message, the mRNA, which is also going to have exons and introns. We're going to then cut out the introns and based on the image we're going to produce two types of messenger RNA. The one on the left is going to produce a protein and the one on the right is going to produce a different protein. Note that the one on the left does not have exon number four and the one on the right does not have exon number three. So they're going to produce two separate types of proteins just by splicing and rearranging the order. This is referred to as alternative RNA splicing. Consequently, the number of different proteins an organism can produce is much greater 
the nu than the number of genes the organism has. So this gene is one gene, but it can produce two types of proteins. Researchers discovered a gene in Drosophila with enough alternative spliced exons to generate 19,000 different membrane proteins. So let's say this gene has 100 exons, meaning exon 1 might be left out of the first protein. Exon 5 might be left out of the next protein. Exon 10 might be left out of the next protein. So there's this gene is, has so many exons and we can produce so many variations to make 19,000 different proteins. And these are all membrane proteins that will be found in the nerve cell of this Drosophila. Based on what we know so far, I have a question here. How can a diverse organism like a human have such a low number of genes? So the Human Genome Project discovered that humans have roughly the same number of genes as a roundworm. The roundworm is in a class called nematoda. An example of a roundworm is the pinworm that, that makes your anus itch late at night when you sleep. The question is, if the nematode has 20,000 genes in one of its cells, how can a human cell only have 20,000 genes? Aren't we more diverse than a roundworm? So how can we be more diverse, but we only have the same number of genes? The answer is alternative RNA splicing, just like with the Drosophila. In humans, we can take that one gene and have so many alternative RNA splicing events that we can create 10,000, 19,000, 20,000 different types of proteins. So each chromosome contains hundreds to thousands of variations to the proteins. So that is why a nematode and a human can have the same number of genes. And how many genes is that? One human cell has roughly 20,500 genes. Chromosome 1 is the largest chromosome in humans and it contains about 2,100 genes. This talks about fibronectin, another gene. This one is in humans. And you also have several different isoforms that will be created through alternative RNA splicing.